made it. You're past the halfway point. How are you feeling? One to five. Five, your tanks are full. You're feeling awesome. One, you're like, no, I got nothing left. Where are you at? Where are you at? I'm feeling like a, one, of, maybe one of these, <laughs> like a 3.5. Cool. But I love it. The threes are still there. I'm still here for you. We are learning so much together, and it's been a really awesome week. I appreciate all the conversations I've had with some of you outside of chapel. Um, I'm loving the pursuit of truth, not just in chapel, but outside of chapel. It's really encouraging to see. Keep chatting with each other and with your counselors about what is true this week. It's a great place to, to talk it out. Before we get started on whatever is true, we have our pun of the day. What is Beethoven's favorite fruit? Ashley? Banana. -na. Banana. -na. Yep, that's great. All right, there we go. So, review of yesterday. Let's see how we got. I'm not yesterday. What am I talking about? Review of Monday. The scientific method must be. Lydia. Observable and repeatable. Very good. Cool. Everyone say it with her. Ready? Observable and repeatable. Very good. All right. Let's try another one. The legal historical method uses three pieces of evidence. Liam. Let's say it with him. Oral testimony, written testimony, and exhibits and artifacts. Very good. Name one piece of evidence that is used to prove the authenticity of the resurrection. Ashley. Avery. 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 I got it. I got it. She didn't name to help me. She did for the past four times. So it's really bad. What? 500 plus eyewitnesses. That's very good. There's another one. A couple of them. Blue shirt right here. Yeah, what's your name? Levi. Go. The New Testament. Yeah, there's a couple of books that all say the same thing. What are those groups of books? That's very good. The Gospels are really good. Coming at you. And one more blue shirt, rose glasses. Say again. Bible's right on. Yep, that's including the New Testament. Coming at you. Oh, bad throw. Bad throw. Help her out. Cool. One more. Is it Nathan? What's your name? Aiden. Aiden. Sorry. Go. Oh, that's big. That's big. We have 12 people. Well, 11 in particular, who are freaked out and they transformed into some people that would die for the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. Very good. One more piece of evidence. White shirt, yep. The locations. You can go visit them today. What's your name? Catherine. Catherine. Coming at you. Bad throw. Man, I keep going to the left. Overcorrect. Got to do it to the right. <laughs> Say with me. 500 eyewitnesses. Transformation of the disciples and the written Gospels in the New Testament. Yep. Okay. Now we're talking about the Bible. What are the three tests of historicity used to prove the authenticity of the Bible? Annika. Yes. Wow. Wow. That's really great. Let's say it with her. Bibliographical test. Internal and external. Very good. All right. Let's try another one. Jesus fulfilled how many major prophecies? This is... This is major. <laughs> uh, Daniel. 60 major prophecies. Say 60 major prophecies. 60 major prophecies. Very good. Micah, get out of there. What are you doing? Each New Testament book was originally written for only, or, watch, originally written only how many years? Dana? Say again. 50. Everyone say 50 years. 50 years. And we're not sure. Very good catch and a better throw than all the other ones. How many earliest manuscripts, I heard that laugh, were written 250 years to 300 years after the original? We're talking a big number here. Greer? 20,000, you say it with me. Oh, what? what? Ah, no, ah, I'm giving away answers. I've ruined my slides. 20,000, we all say it, 20,000. And the answer to this one, don't say it yet though. This is big, this is from yesterday. Belittling others, and self-deprecation. We all just saw the answer. What is it? Pride. pride. Yeah, they're both forms of pride. Mr. Bergen pointed out to me yesterday, they're, they're really just two sides of the same coin. It's all the same thing. We need to throw that to the side, cast it to the Lord, surrender it to Him, and choose to see ourselves in relationship to God, not to each other. 
right? Very good. What examples of humility from yesterday can we uh, intentionally use to combat pride? So instead of, oh, look, I dropped a starburst. Hmm, let's save that for later. What can you do instead of pride? And don't just say humility. Give me something specific. Yes, black hair? Go ahead. Say again? Encourage others is one of them. Yep, that's great. Good. Blue shirt? Pray. Yes, pray. And there's one more that I mentioned yesterday, too. Uh, Caleb? Read the scripture and meditate on it, which is what we're going to do today and tomorrow. Let's read them together. Go. Encourage, pray, memorize, meditate on applicable scripture. You're not just memorizing and meditating any scripture. When you know you struggle with something in your head or in your heart, you look for scriptures that specifically apply to that. You meditate on them and you pray through them and God will change your mind and heart. That's how it works. It's his design. His word says to do that. We start in a minute. We're going to start by praying again. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. It's a biblical thing. You don't need to shave your head and wear a toga to meditate. You can still meditate as a Christian. It's a good thing to do. It's not this weird thing. So we talked about Jesus' resurrection. Most ridiculous claim. The other most ridiculous claim, the Bible is actually legit. Yesterday, we talked about our public performance. I apologize. These slides were not exactly the same as yesterday. I, I, my slides weren't perfect for yesterday. But now they are. We make mistakes. That's cool. Public performance was yesterday. How do we view ourselves in relationship to each other? And really, more importantly, how do we view ourselves in relationship with God? Fourthly, that's today. This is a mouthful. We're going to memorize this title. It's plenty of perfect private performance. Oops, I did it wrong. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. What? We're going to talk about pursuing the Lord in private. That's the short of it. And then finally, tomorrow, we're going to practice what we learned today. So today is more of the concepts. So we'll talk about how they work. And then tomorrow, we're going to do them. So tomorrow, don't forget, bring a pencil if you didn't already. Always um, bring a pencil to rehearsal. And tomorrow is going to be a rehearsal of our practice of meditation on God's Word. So today, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Can you emphasize those words when you read it with me? Ready? Go. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. You can do more. Ready? Go again. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Yes. So notice the, the equation. You must start in private. Lay that foundation to prepare yourself for performance. Remember yesterday I said um, I did things out of order. I talked about performance before being in private. I, I did that on purpose because of the timing of things. I thought it was important for you to hear. But really, in reality, this conversation we're going to have today is, is even more essential. That we start in private, pursuing the Lord. And it's going to set us up for success when we perform for others. All right, let's pray. Lord, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts this morning be acceptable in your sight. We are your servants. Teach us from your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Let's read our theme verse. You say it with me. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned... In other words, days one and two, think about what's true. Days three, four, five, we're on day four right now, put it into practice. Let's talk about how to do it. Oh, blank blue slide. Oh, yes. Yes, hold on, hold on. So I forgot what was next. <laughs> um, so we're talking about practicing today. Let's, let's talk about real briefly what it means to practice musically. You've seen, do we have any memes in the music building right now? I know we have in the past. I love, I love myself some, some practice memes. Let's read this one. Your claim is practiced. You claimed you practiced, but your instrument was here all weekend. Fascinating. Raise your hand if you've ever experienced that ridicule from your teacher in the past. Or, or you forgot your books at home when you came to your lesson. That's interesting. Hmm, hmm, very interesting. Yeah, we've, we've all done that before. Yoda, fail you will if practice you must. Won't. I said it wrong. If practice, you won't. 
Yes, and my favorite. <laughs> so good. It's so good. So good. <clears throat> the fact that I desperately need to practice psh, no, literally anything else is better than practicing. Come on. Who, who relates with that sometimes? Like, I don't want to practice right now. Just do it later. Yeah, hands down. Yeah. But you know that practice is essential to get you ready for a performance. So you have to go practice. And it can be really fun when you do too. All right. Um, let's see. Someone, probably in your, in your family, <laughs> I wonder if it's mom, dad, sister, grandma, dog, reminds you to practice every week. Oh, it would be interesting if your dog was trained to remind you to practice. Oh! You're like, oh yeah, right, right, yeah, I remember. <laughs> no, thanks for the reminder. Um, yeah, but, let's see, sorry, I don't want him to skip something. Oh, yeah, here's the, here's the big question. You ever been asked this before? after your performance. Wow, that was just so amazing. How many hours did you put into practicing that piece? Has anyone ever been asked that question before? Or like, how much time did you put into that? That's crazy. And you're like, uh, how do I answer that question? I don't know how to answer that question. And especially for someone who, who doesn't actively practice music, when they ask you that question, they don't even appreciate and I'm not trying to push, put them down, but they, they just don't understand the amount of time or diligence that it goes into performing something like that. So you say like, well, maybe like I put in an hour a day or something like that, and then I did that for like three years because that piece took me three stinking years to learn because it's so stinking hard, maybe. Well, I, I asked Google, how much time would you recommend putting in in preparing for a performance? It gave me a ratio. In relationship to performance time, how much time should you practice? And it suggested, let's see if you agree with this. It suggested, oh, what did it say? <laughs> I don't want to say it wrong. It suggested one hour of practice for every minute you perform. <laughs> yeah, ridiculous, right? Google, you don't know what's going on. So that's, that means if you have a five minute piece, ah, five minute piece, easy, right? Yeah, it's only five minutes. It suggests you only practice five hours. That's all you need to prepare for the recital, right? Right? <laughs> you know, I, I found on another website though, it suggested that that's only, that ratio might only hold true if you already know the music, and that practice time is actually just rehearsal time. And okay, maybe you can agree with that. Maybe, like, okay, I've already learned the piece, I need to spend five hours rehearsing with people before we perform it. Maybe that's true? I don't know. I wonder, I wonder if with your lessons, I wonder if you would agree with this ratio that your teacher tells you. I've, I've often heard this, for an hour weekly lesson, which is not a recital, it's just a a mini performance for your teacher, right? It's often suggested by teachers to practice five hours a week for every one hour of lesson, something like that. Do you have, have you been suggested to practice more or less than that? More than five hours a week, same, less than that, where are you at? Cool, all right, cool. All right, hands down, hands down. So the, the point is, Chehi, you know, yo, yo, thanks. You know that like, there's no perfect ratio here to come up. It's kind of a silly conversation. Like Every piece is unique. Some pieces need a lot of work. I'm working on a piece right now that is a bear on, for piano. It's difficult. And I need to spend a lot more time on that than I would on a different piece. There's no perfect ratio. It's just dependent on the piece, your ability, and all that kind of stuff. But we can agree that you need to put in a lot of time to prepare for a very short performance. It's crazy how much time goes in ahead of time. So the question then becomes, what quantity of practice will yield a quality performance? Well, maybe we need to ask another question besides that. Uh, my, coach, my coach for soccer and basketball in middle school, he, he said, uh, he would always make fun of the saying, practice makes perfect. Anyone heard that before? Practice makes perfect, yeah. And he's like, no, you're wrong. He said, perfect practice makes perfect. And I was always like humbled by that. I'm like, oh darn it, I have to do everything right when I practice. I can't just go in there and fake it. 
It's true. Now, when he says perfect practice, oh, oh. Please, 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 please. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so two-step violin, who's familiar? Two-step violin, yeah. If you're not, you gotta check them out when you go home. Two-step, they suggest a ratio of 72 hours a day, because that's possible, to beat Ling Ling, because Ling Ling already won the competition. Yes, we, you know, if we had time, honestly, I would not mind just spending the rest of chapel watching two-step, but we gotta do other things, so let's keep going. So we agree, a huge quantity of practice must precede that quantity of performance. But then the next question is this, what quality of practice yields a really high quality of performance? Well, I think you probably know that answer too, right? This is where that saying comes in. Perfect practice makes perfect. I do this, can you show me this? When you put quotations around something, in this case, it means yeah, with an asterisk attached. It's not really perfect. You're allowed to make mistakes in practice, but the idea is you do it very well in practice. If you don't do very well and you're not, you're not pursuing excellence in your practice sessions, you're not going to perform an excellent uh, show. If you're sloppy in practice, how can you possibly be excellent in your performance? So we must agree then that here's our equation. This is essential, you might wanna write this down, it's important. High quality practice plus a high quantity of that practice yields a high quality performance. In other words, let's, uh, I'm gonna move on, five seconds, ready? Five, five, three, three, one, all right, next one. Here's the simplified. A lot of good practice yields a good performance. Is that fair? Is that fair? You need that, right? You need, you need a lot of it. You need to make it really good to make the performance really good. You can't, be, you can't practice really well once and hope that the performance is gonna be good unless, unless you have a lot of background with that piece. That's a very unusual circumstance. You must practice a lot really well. So this now applies not just to music, but it applies to our relationship with God and it applies to how, we, how well we know the Bible. Let's see, make sure I'm ready. Um, yes, so we're on to our theme one more time. This, I think you see where I'm going now. The perfect, the perfect private practice is now defined. Let's try reading the whole thing again, but can you emphasize the underline? Say it. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. One more time. Can you say it in your best operatic voice though? Like as though you're singing, ready? Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Thank you, very good. So this means it's better to meditate or practice a small chunk of your music or a small passage of the Bible, same principle applies, than to read a huge passage or practice your entire piece and continue to mess up on the same spot or without meditating on it. Let me read that again. It's better to meditate on a small chunk of scripture than to read the whole passage, a huge chunk, and not meditate on it. wonder if you've been like me in most of my devotional life. When, when you sit down to read the word, you read a chapter, you're like, oh, it's nice. You might even think, that's like, I really like what he has to say. Close the book, move on to the next thing. In five minutes, you've completely forgotten what you've read. Anyone else been there? Yeah, it's frustrating. Like I put in the time and I don't, don't remember anything. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like playing through a piece once and expecting to be really good at it in the future. No, you need to actually repeat it and do it a lot and come at it from lots of different angles and make it perfect for it to stick in your head, for you to memorize it, produce it, and perform it really well. The same would apply here. God's designed our brain to work well and to, to study scripture in the same way that we could study music and other, other areas of our life. Let's see. Sorry, I don't want to skip anything again. Okay, let's be honest. This is why we're chatting about this. I always felt frustrated in your shoes 
as a middle schooler. Um, it's only 10 years ago. Um, I, was, I was really frustrated by this equation when I didn't, I didn't wrap my, hand, my head around it. I would just spend a good amount of time in God's Word. I didn't like it. I was doing it because I was supposed to. I guilt-tripped myself into doing it. Like, I need to do this because that's what you're supposed to do. The preacher keeps telling me, you got to spend time in God's Word. And I did. And I was, I, like, I remember actually getting so angry once, like, <laughs> having this head game, saying, I hate reading the Bible. I, I was actually thinking that. I hate reading the Bible. I don't want to hate reading the Bible. I want to love it. I'm supposed to love it. What's the matter with me? <laughs> I hate reading it. And I talked to my mom. She said, you know what? Just take a break for a minute. Come, like, take a break for two weeks. Best advice she ever gave me. It was just a two-week break. I came back to it, and she had given me a couple of specific things I could try differently. Specifically, some disciplines, some meditation practices that helped me actually process what I was reading. Not just reading mindlessly and having a horrible time reading the Word. So, that's where we're going today. I'm going to try to give you some tools that changed my life. When I was your age, I took a hold of them. I started reading God's Word and enjoying it. And not only enjoying it, but it changed my life. I'm so different today and every day because I read and meditate on God's Word. I'm not perfect with it. <laughs> Many times I still am like, oh, shoot, i got to get out the door and get to work or get on to Chehi or whatever. <laughs> I've done it this week. Read the passage. Ah, dang it, I don't have time to meditate on it. I guess I'm going to have to close the Bible and go. But if we can meditate on it and do it right, it's going to stick and be meaningful for us. So there's six, is that right? Yep, six different tactics that we're going to try. Pray, read, and, oh, that's only three. <laughs> Pray, read, meditate. Where am I? We're going to skip this for the sake of time. Interruption. Do you remember the title? Let's try to say it with me. Ready? Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Very good. Let's keep rolling. Here's your six methods of meditation. First one. Try it. Write down, right now, if you got something to write, or log it in your head. Rewrite the text in your own words. Two, illustrate the text. Anyone like to draw or color? Yeah, this is full permission. As you read the Bible, try to draw or color on a separate piece of paper what you're reading. It's a great way to process. Three, pray through the text. We've actually started every sermon and finished every sermon that way saying, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Some, some texts are prayer. Some texts are not, and you can still pray through them. We'll talk about how to do that. Interruption. Oh, what's our title? Can you say it with me? Try it. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Say it again. Plenty of perfect private practice precedes public performance. Good. Fourth method, inductive study. We're going to try this tomorrow. That's why you need your pencil. Trace the key terms. So, for example, in the book of Proverbs, a great key term to follow along with is wisdom or folly. I put a little light bulb next to wisdom because it gives me an idea. Every time I see wisdom, I write down a light bulb. Every time I see folly, I highlight it in red. Bad folly. And then I can see how those themes trace through. Fifth, gospel connection. This is really helpful with those Sorry, Old Testament. The boring Old Testament parts, right? Like Jeremiah, just finished that book. It's a bear. It's just talking about how bad Israel is all the time. But if you can connect how bad Israel is to how bad we are, to how great Jesus is, how Jesus died for the sins of all mankind so that we can have hope in him, whoa, suddenly Jeremiah has some really important meaning for our lives. And fifthly, oh, fifthly, I can count. Sixthly, memorize the text. I'm going to show you how I memorize. We won't have time to do it today, but I want to show you how we do it. Oh, seventhly. Seventhly? That's not a word. I'm making it a word. Seventhly. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. That's a wrong verse. Sorry. That's our theme verse. Whatever is true, ask that question of those really tough Old Testament passages. What is true about this text? Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Make that correction. I love using that for those tough ones. Let's memorize the text. Here is a really fun one that I want to show you how to do. Um, 
you do not have to memorize the way that I do. I memorize kind of weird. But if you know anything about music, it's one of the most engaging activities for your brain. It gets your whole brain involved. So if you can memorize God's word using music, it's going to stick. If you just use any other tactic besides music, it might stick, but you have to really work at it to keep it there. Does anyone have a, any piece of scripture memorized via music that they already know? Just, you don't have to say it, just if you know it already. That's cool. It's very helpful, right? Here's what I do. I'll turn a metronome on. Click, 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 and then I'll just start saying the words and try to figure out, okay, where does it line up with the music? Click, click. Do not merely listen to the word. Okay. So every time I see an underlined word, I put in, I'm lining it up with the beat. Do not merely listen to the word, right? That's what I'm going for. Cool. Snap, stop. Love it. Another part, if I ever have to move really quick, I'll hyphenate words. It just helps me remember. So I'll hyphenate to just connect them all and be like, oh, that's got to be really fast. Sometimes I didn't write it in, but sometimes I'll do a little triplet bracket because I'm that nerdy. <laughs> I'm boring triplets in scripture. It's, it's ridiculous. So triplet in scripture, and it helps me remember, oh, right, this is a really fast triplet. So let me demo for you. I need you. I need you to give me a good beat. Ready? One, two, give me snaps. Ready, go. My turn. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if we had time, we would try this together. But you can see where you go with this. Y'all are musicians. Figure it out. Look at a passage of scripture and make it rhythmic. Or if you like writing a melody to it, do that too. It's really fun. It takes a while, but it can be so much fun. You can be creative musically. God loves it. He's like, no, this nerd is setting my, my scripture to music. That's so fun. And then you get it stuck in your head and it comes back to you. It's really helpful. We're going to fly through all this. Funk. All right. What's today's theme again? You say it with me. Plenty of perfect private practice proceeds public performance. Very good. Cool. What's our equation? Do you remember? What's your name? Elizabeth? Yeah, I got you, Elizabeth. What is it? Ooh, that's good. Let's say it with her. Oh, what? Why? Let's say it with her. High quantity practice plus high quality practice receives high quality performance. In other words, a lot of good practice makes a good performance. Name and describe one of the six methods of meditation. We, we had to fly through this, but let's see if you remember. Um, oh, I should know your name. You've told me. I don't remember it. Blue shirt right here. Lucas, yeah. Yeah, rewrite the text. That's a good one. That's the first one. Yep. Let's name a few others. Gray shirt. Illustrate the text. You can draw it or color it. Very good. Yeah. Dana. Yes. Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Ignore the wrong reference. It's Philippians 4, 8 to 9. Here you go. I don't want to hit you. All right, one more. Red. Red shirt. Forgot your name. Pray through the text. What's your name again? Victoria, right. That's right. I forgot that. I'm so sorry. And the other two, we'll say them now. Let's read them all the way from the top. Go. Rewrite the text in your own words. Illustrate the text. Pray through the text. Inductive study. Freeze. That means key terms. That's, I love that one. My Bible turns so colorful when I start to do that. Next. Gospel connection. Memorize the text. Oh, and then the seventh one, is it there? Nope. I took it off. The last one was Philippians 4, which verses? 8 to, 8 to 9. Very good. For tomorrow, please bring coloring materials if you like to color. This will allow you to try to practice illustrating the text. If you're like, oh, I love coloring, bring that stuff. Okay? Tomorrow, before tomorrow, if you want to try to memorize Philippians 4, 8 to 9, that's our...
theme and recite it to either myself or any other counselor here. You all counselors, I'm hoping you raise your hand if you saw that text this morning about that. Cool. Yeah, love it. Raise, no, check, check that text this morning. Here's what happened. I sent, I sent the counselors the verse. Counselors, you're, you're going to have campers come to you saying, I'm going to try to recite the verse. Count, campers, it'll, it's only going to work if you recite it perfectly, first or second try. We can't help you out. We have lots of things to do. So we can help you out in, in memorizing it, but as far as the test goes, we can't just let you try and try and try until you get it. Okay? That's what practicing is for, and when you go to perform it, since you practiced it so well, you'll perform it really well for your counselor. Or me. You can find me too. The first, the first group of people to recite this to me can get some sick Chehi merch. Check it out. You got your Chehi bag. We got a Chehi disc. Who loves, my, who loves some disc golf? Or my disc golf? Or not disc golf. Fr Ultimate Frisbee, right? We got that. We got a Chehi water bottle. We got some Chehi, some, some retro Chehi bands from last year. And we got some socks, Chehi socks. Yo, that, let's go. So much fun. Oh, yeah. So, if you would like one of these, Grace, is there a music stand right there next to you? Cool, I'm gonna go set these up in a minute before y'all dismiss. And Miss Lauren, is there one next to you too? A music stand? Oh, they just go out that door, that's fine, cool. So I'm gonna put these on the music stand. If you wanna to try to memorize this by singing it, sing your hearts out, memorize it, draw it, whatever. Memorize it, recite it to a counselor before chapel time tomorrow. By when? Yeah, and then I'll get a text from your counselor saying this person recited, and then I'll give you a prize after chapel tomorrow. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it can be a lot of fun to read your word and that we can, we can really enjoy reading your word, that it can change our lives forever and conform us to the image of your perfect son, who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Lord, he, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross for our sake. We praise you for his humble example. Will we live in light of that? Help us live in light of that. We need your enabling to do so. Guide us today as we have a lot of music making to do. Guide us as we practice. Help us to practice well and do everything as unto your name for your glory. We pray all of this in your son's name. Amen.